This happened a few years back. I used to work for an old leisure center. I finished work at 12 a.m. I got back home, showered, and was about to go to bed. Suddenly, my phone started ringing. It was one of the security guys that works nights. He said, uh, the alarms are going off. You need to investigate it. This happened a few times in the past. The alarms were old and malfunctioned every now and then. Only managers had the authority to reset the alarm. My boss hates to be bothered by the alarms, so he pays managers $70 to go out and reset them. It's only 20 minutes of work, so I thought, why not? I'll go do it. I arrived at the building. First, I had to investigate the building to make sure nothing out of the ordinary was going on. First, I turned off the alarms because they were obnoxiously loud. Next, I began to walk around and check all the rooms. Before I made it to the staff room, I heard this massive crash. I froze in fear. The staff room door in front of me suddenly swung open. A massive man walked out. I'm six foot two and this person, I'm not exaggerating, was at least seven feet tall. We exchanged views with each other. The man just stared at me and didn't move a muscle. Out of nowhere, he let out a massive roar and started to chase me around the building. I was so frightened and full of adrenaline that I ran out of the building. There was a trash bin behind the building. I quickly jumped inside and immediately called the police. When I heard the police sirens, a feeling of relief flowed through me. The police never did find the man. The very next day, I quit my job there. I was an architecture student in Metro Manila when this story happened. I had already graduated, but I still remember this story clear as day. For our midterm project one year, we were given the topic of morgues. We were required to have an ocular visit before creating our own design. My classmates and I went to different hospitals with a request letter from the architecture department. However, our request was declined by the hospitals, informing us that we need more paperwork before our request can be approved. I knew that preparing all that paperwork would take so much time, which I couldn't afford. Some of my classmates had already left the hospital, while two of my friends and I, Dwen and Joy, stayed to try and find a way into the morgue. We were eager to get the data and photos we needed in order to start our project as soon as possible. So naturally, we found a way to sneak ourselves into the morgue, although we were soon to pay the price of this desperate action. We were standing in front of a locked morgue door when we saw a man crying next to two medical personnel. They didn't seem to notice that we were outsiders, probably because we were wearing surgical masks and our school uniforms. We all looked at each other and decided to just act natural. One of the medical personnel unlocked the door and I asked if we could enter. Without hesitation, he said, yeah, of course. As soon as he opened the door, I saw a body covered in a white cloth lying on a gurney. He moved the white cloth from the face of the corpse, revealing the person's old and pale face. He asked the man in tears if he could identify the body. The man answered that he was his relative. I felt so sad for the man. While they kept talking, my friend and I observed the place and took pictures of the spaces. The morgue was absolutely filthy and unkempt. The white tiles were turning yellow and the hospital equipment was randomly scattered around with the metal materials all covered with rust. Drops of water were falling eerily out of the faucet by the sink. We observed further and made our way into a dark corner of the morgue. Then, all of the lights suddenly went out and the door to the morgue slammed shut and locked us all inside. We all started freaking out immediately. We are locked inside of a dark rundown morgue with an exposed corpse lying right beside us. 
The reality of the situation hit us when Dwen started to pound on the door, shouting and calling for one of the medical personnel to open it. Joy followed after her, pounding on the door as well. All we could hear was shallow moaning sounds in the background. We had no idea where they were coming from. I was literally about to piss myself out of fear. Thank God, after a few minutes the door opened and the medical personnel let us out. They were so confused as to how we even got inside. They thought we were interns and asked what we're doing, but in short, we were busted. Luckily, they were kind enough not to tell on us. Joy and I had to accompany Dwen on her way home since she was still in utter shock. We talked about what it would have been like if we'd been locked inside that morgue the whole night. Just the thought of that was too much for us to bear. We all learned our lesson after this encounter. Never try to sneak your way into a morgue without permission. You might find yourself spending a night in a room full of dead corpses. My name is Henry. I'm from a small town in Iowa. I live in an area where fishing and outdoor activities are really popular. On this particular day, I decided to go catfishing with my friend Connor. We planned to fish at our local campground at around 10 p.m. that evening. The reason we went out so late is because the fishing is much better then. We arrived at the campground and everything seemed normal. We found a good spot by the lake and casted out our lines. An entire hour went by and we didn't catch a thing. I told Connor to help me pack up so we could try a different spot. We drove to the next spot, which was only a few miles away. Once we got there, I could see another group in the distance down the road. Connor and I didn't really think much of this and figured they must be a fishing or a camping group. There was a small dock that led out to the lake. We set up to fish at the end of the dock. We started fishing and got in our zone. Before we knew it, it was around 12 a.m. Then, out of nowhere, I noticed this creepy, rusted-out, cream-colored van coming down the road. It had the dimmest headlights I ever saw. It slowly drove past us. Connor and I brushed it off as some other guys coming out to fish. The van vanished down the road. Another 20 minutes went by. To my disappointment, we still didn't catch a fish. I told Connor we should just pack up and come back another day. All of a sudden, we heard squeaking wheels. We turned around and saw the van coming back down the road. It was going really slow, probably about four miles per hour. There was a small playground back behind the road. The van turned and faced the playground. All of a sudden, the dim headlights lit up. They were so bright they seemed like military-grade lights. The playground was as bright as day. The van suddenly stopped. The sliding door of the van swung open, and both back doors opened as well. What I saw next made me freeze. The guy who got out the side had an all-black suit on, and wore a red purge mask. The guy who got out of the back had a black skin suit as well. They jumped and creeped around on the playground. Then they disappeared into the woods, leaving their van parked there. I played it off as some teenagers goofing around and trying to mess with people. I didn't want to let them ruin my night. Finally, after about 15 minutes, they came out of the woods. They got back in the van, and right as they were about to leave, 
My friend Connor walked over to them. He shined his phone's light at them. They turned the van around to face us. The light blinded us. After getting our bearings, we bolted for our car. The creepy van slowly followed behind us. We got in the car and I turned my brights on. What I saw next scares me to this day. I saw five guys, all dressed in clown outfits, and they all had purge masks on. They were waving at us to come over. I started honking my horn and sped off in the other direction, passing the van. I don't know what would have happened to us if we had stayed. We told local law enforcement about the incident, but they said they couldn't do anything. Ever since, I carry a knife on me. Thanks for watching. You can watch a similar video here. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay tuned for more videos. It was my best friend's bachelor party. We decided to book an Airbnb just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. The house was massive. It was a two-story, six-bedroom, colonial-style house. Before arriving, the host told us that there was actually a seventh bedroom, but that it was off-limits. She said something about her personal items being stored there. Upon arriving at the house, the six of us scrambled to claim our bedrooms. Of course, I happened to get stuck with the smallest room. My room had a small twin bed. The space didn't even have a dresser. To the right of the bed was a tiny door. It seemed to be made for a person about four feet tall. I tried to open it, but it was locked. I figured it was just a space for storage. My mind went back to the seventh bedroom. I figured the seventh bedroom had to be pretty big, considering it was the owner's. I thought if I could find the room, I would be able to stay there and have way more space. I thought if I left the seventh room as I found it, the owner wouldn't know the difference. I suggested to everyone in the house that we should try and look for the seventh bedroom. No one protested, and we took it as a game to find it. After about an hour of searching, we didn't find anything. We thought the host had to be lying, and that there was no seventh bedroom after all. After arriving back at the Airbnb from a night on the town, one of my friends brought up the seventh bedroom again. We all agreed that we had already searched every nook and cranny of the house, and that there was no extra bedroom. I thought to myself, the only place we haven't really looked yet was that small door in my bedroom. I told everyone about the small door in my room, and everyone was intrigued. I led everyone to my room and showed them the weird four-foot door. One of the guys tried pulling on the handle, but it was locked. The lock seemed really simple, and it looked like a coin could unlock it. Sure enough, we tried to unlock it with a quarter, and it unlocked. The door opened and revealed a passageway. Everyone was in awe. I was too tall to walk through the opening, so I got on my knees and began crawling through the small door. The corridor in front of me was about 8 feet long. The end of the pathway opened up into a room. I thought this has to be the seventh bedroom. So many questions were running through my mind. Why didn't the bedroom connect normally to the rest of the house? Why was there this weird corridor that connected to it? I crawled to the opening of the room and everything was pitch black. I moved my hand along the wall and felt a switch. I flicked the switch and the room illuminated in front of me. I was shocked at what was in front of me. Creepy looking dolls surrounded me. There were dolls on the walls and in every corner of the room. 
they were all different shapes and sizes. The weirdest thing was that there was even a doll tucked into a small bed in the center of the room. My friends were in quick pursuit behind me, and they all had the same reaction as they entered the room. For the rest of the weekend, let's just say I slept on the couch. I had just moved out of my small single bedroom apartment. I signed a lease to move into a larger unit in the same complex, but my lease didn't start for a few days. I had nowhere to stay in the meantime, so I decided to book a nearby Airbnb. The place was a nice two-story house. I was greeted by a husband and wife upon arriving. They seemed like a wonderful couple. They told me that they lived in the downstairs portion of the house with their younger son. They said the second floor was all mine. The second floor was very standard. It had one room and a bathroom across from it. I unloaded my belongings in the room. It was a nice space with a large queen-size bed. The only strange thing were all the pictures. On both nightstands and the dresser, there were pictures of the same kid. He looked to be about 13 years old. I thought this had to be their younger son and that he must live in this room when it wasn't being rented out. I didn't think anything of it. Before going to bed, the wife knocked on my door and said, I'm making breakfast for everyone in the morning. You're welcome to join. I said, that would be wonderful. She said, Oh, by the way, if you hear or feel anything weird, don't pay any attention to it. Before I could even process what she said or respond, she slammed the door shut. I didn't know what to think. Part of me wanted to leave. I already paid for the place, so I decided to stay. Usually, I never had issues falling asleep, but I just couldn't shake what the wife had said to me. I pulled out my iPad and watched Netflix. This was the perfect distraction. Finally, I fell asleep. In my dreamlike state, I felt my bed covers getting pulled off of me. I sat straight up. The covers were pulled completely off of me. They were in a heap at the base of the bed. I was shook. My whole body was shaking in fear. The room also felt extremely cold all of a sudden. I got the courage to get out of bed. I walked to the door and locked it. There was a closet in the corner of the room. The door was shut to it. I vaguely remembered the closet door being wide open before I fell asleep. I made my way closer to the closet. I was anxious to open it, to make sure no one was there. I thought maybe the couple's son was playing tricks on me. When I grabbed the handle, a wave of fear ran through me. I had this feeling that something was in there. Some kind of presence. Scared but curious, I turned the handle. I saw the silhouette of a kid. It was the same kid in the pictures. I blinked and he disappeared. I didn't know what to think. I went back to bed, but falling asleep was impossible. I stayed awake all night thinking about what had occurred. The next morning, I went downstairs for breakfast. The husband and wife were sitting at the table already. I looked around and there was no sign of their son. I asked if their son would be joining us, and they said he'll be out in a couple of minutes. After about five minutes, the husband yelled, Timmy, breakfast is ready. Don't make me come in there. Finally, Timmy came out of his room and joined us for breakfast. Timmy looked no older than eight. He had light blonde hair. My mind went back to the pictures in my room. I realized Timmy couldn't be the kid in the pictures. Now I was curious. I asked the wife, 
Do you happen to have another son? I instantly knew the question hit the wrong nerve. Her demeanor changed and her face turned pale. She didn't respond to me. About 10 seconds went by and she finally said, Yes, I had another son, but he was in an accident and I don't want to talk about it. I wish I had never asked the question in the first place and I felt horrible. The rest of the breakfast was so awkward. No one said a word. Finally, Timmy broke the awkward silence. He asked if I wanted to go play video games with him. I quickly agreed. I was so happy to get out of the awkward atmosphere. While playing with Timmy, I couldn't stop my curiosity. I asked Timmy, how old was your brother when the accident happened? Timmy replied, 13 years old. I then asked where the accident happened. Timmy didn't say anything, and he just pointed towards the ceiling. My stomach dropped. My room was right above us. I went to Miami for a business trip. I didn't have much money at the time, so I booked the cheapest possible Airbnb. The trip was last minute, so I didn't take much time to look over any details of the place. After arriving in Miami, I went straight to my job site. I worked all day and didn't get to the Airbnb until around 11 p.m. The outside of the place looked pretty creepy. It was a large, black, industrial looking building. I thought this had to be the wrong place until a door cracked open. An old lady appeared out from the door and asked, Is this John? I answered, Yes, this is John. She said, Follow me, honey. She led me inside. I followed her up a pitch black staircase to a large black door. Before opening the door, she said, We have one rule, no speaking at all, under any circumstances. We feel it provides a better experience for the guests if there is absolute silence. I thought, <laughs> what did I get myself into? What kind of place is this? She opened the door and my jaw dropped. There were ten beds sprawled across the floor about a foot apart. All the beds were occupied besides one in the middle. I thought this was some sort of bad nightmare. I thought back to when I booked the Airbnb, and I remembered it had said, Open Plan Apartment. I had no idea this is what it meant. Before the old lady could say another word, I left as fast as possible. Thanks for watching. You can watch a similar video here. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay tuned for more videos. I always knew my boss was a creepy guy. I'm not talking just about your regular run-of-the-mill creepy. No, this was a man you wouldn't want to be trapped in a room alone with, much less work for every evening of the week. Yes, that was my life as a teenager. My parents had suddenly decided that I needed a job, especially during the summer months between school semesters. Thus, I ended up doing evening shifts at a local grocery store for minimum wage. It certainly didn't help that our store was involved in far too many police investigations. Several missing person cases had built up over the years, all in our neighborhood. Of course, since they were mostly drug addicts or gang members, the police signed it off as unimportant, random killings. Five years I spent working there. That all came to an end in July of 2019, when I almost lost my life at work. It was just another summer, and I struggled to afford a new computer. 
Since I'd been there for so long, I was fairly familiar with the system. I'd even been given my own set of keys, full on with a custom, name-branded keychain. One night, I'd accidentally left my keys at home, and I was supposed to close down the store. The rest of the staff had already left, so I hesitantly decided to ask my boss. He reluctantly agreed and started going over paperwork while I shut down the store. If my knee didn't ache like usual, I'd just do it myself. Don't forget your keys again, he said, annoyed. Just like my own set of keys, he had one for the office, one for the break room, one for the front door, and one for the cash registers. But he had an additional key I didn't recognize. It was a rusty piece of metal that clearly predated the relatively new locks of the store. But why would he keep it alongside his work keys? I knew the store like the back of my hand, or at least most of it. The basement was a mystery, as it had been mostly off-limits. To the best of my knowledge, it held the generator and was supposedly not safe. Still, I had to know what the key belonged to. Being a stupid teenager and with curiosity that outweighed my common sense by a ton, I decided to investigate. The basement door itself didn't require a key. Its lock was broken and it slid up without problem. I immediately felt a wave of heat as I walked down the stairs. Sure enough, it was just a dank room full of ancient generators and rusted metal. I turned my flashlight on to get a better look. Only then did I notice a door I hadn't seen before. I tried to open it, but it was locked. I took a moment to consider how angry my creepy boss would be if he found out, but what more could he possibly do other than firing me, a fact that wouldn't matter since I was heading off to college next year. After a moment of contemplation, I put the key in the lock. A click was heard and the door opened up. No sooner had I taken a step inside before I felt shivers run down my spine. It was ungodly cold in there, as if I had just entered a freezer. What I saw was just a short, dark hallway that led into another room. I slowly kept moving, constantly checking behind me to see if my boss had heard me go inside. Frost had clung to the walls and floor, making it a slippery trek down the hall. Once I finally entered the room, I shined my flashlight around. It was indeed a freezer, one with several meat hooks, each holding onto moldy chunks of flesh. As I got closer, I quickly realized that they were human bodies. I gasped and slipped on the icy floor. I groaned loudly in pain as I fell, but fear overtook. I got to my feet and inspected the bodies as I tried not to gag. I could even recognize some of them. I'd seen their faces on missing person posters. These were all the people that had disappeared in the past few years. I really wish you hadn't seen that, I heard my boss say from down the hall. W what have you done? I asked in panic. He didn't respond. He just slowly approached me, blocking my only exit. I always thought fondly of you but I can't let you get away with knowledge of this place. 
Stay the fuck away from me, you creep. I shot back as I tried to appear brave. He was twice my size. There was no way I could fight my way out. Then I remembered his knee. It was an unstable mess from an old injury he constantly complained about. It was my only hope. I swiftly kicked it, and he came tumbling down as he swore at me. I'm going to f kill you, he yelled. I jumped over him, almost slipping on the floor in the process. I ran out from the basement and fled the store. I didn't stop running, nor did I check behind me until I made my way home 15 minutes later. As I got home, I collapsed from exhaustion and fear. Once my panic had faded and my brain started to function again, I called the police. They were quick to respond and stormed the Walmart within minutes. Unfortunately, it was still too late. My boss had vanished alongside the bodies. At first, the police officers were angry at me for calling without proof. But once they found traces of blood left behind, they finally believed my story. To this day, he hasn't been caught, nor have any bodies been recovered. Officially, the missing cases are still unrelated, but I know the truth. That man, he's still out there. So if you hear about any mysterious disappearances in the area, be careful. I work the graveyard shift at Walmart. Being a cashier, I've noticed that people who shop past midnight are either night owls or freak shows. At first glance, the guy looked like a night owl. Long hair, mid-thirties, eyeglasses, some colorful ink. He was buying a 50-gallon plastic storage bin. But when he took the lid off, revealing the other purchases he'd stowed inside, sirens began ringing in my head. 12 pack of extra duty duct tape, 20 ounce steel hammer, 6 piece set of pliers, 9 inch tapered fillet knife, 20 volt cordless reciprocating saw, a half dozen 32 ounce bottles of sulfuric acid. As I rang him up, my eyes wavered between the toolkit of torture devices and the tattoos on his forearms. He had lots of tribal patterns and alpha male images. But the one that really grabbed me was the black teardrop tattoo emanating from his right eye. I kept my face down, eye on my own business. As long as I didn't draw too much attention, maybe we could just both pretend he wasn't prepping for a spree of murder and disembodiment. But then he spoke. I got a home improvement project. Old lady is always ragging on me. He had a noticeable lisp. You got an old lady? No, just three German shepherds, I replied. Another customer entered my aisle. She was blonde and petite, pushing a cart with a baby carrier mounted in the child seat. I could hear the baby crying. The woman watched as I finished scanning the sociopath's purchases replacing them all back inside the storage bin. I noticed she was freaking the hell out as well, her eyes wide open like an owl. I finally said, your total is $336.14. He whipped out a wad of bills and peeled off some fifties. As I finished the transaction and handed him the change, he turned his attention to the young mother. Can I see the baby? She whispered, of course, as she tried putting on a polite smile, but her lips were trembling as she pivoted the baby carrier so he could get a look at her. The baby, no more than a few months old, had bright blue eyes that seemed focused on the creation of spit bubbles. Boy or girl? 
the sociopath asked. Girl, what's her name? The new mother hesitated. Sarah. The sociopath took the baby's hand and wiggled it. The mother and I watched the handshake with matching distress. Well, you both have a blessed night. He picked up his bin of horrors and went out the doors. The mother immediately began wiping down her baby's hands with an antibacterial towelette. I've never seen him around here. Her eyes darted between the doors and her baby. Neither have I. Hopefully he's passing through. I rang up her box of Pampers and bottle of Pinot Noir. I'm going to be drinking that whole bottle tonight. She paid and I bagged up the bottle. I was wondering, she said as her eyes kept moving between the doors and her baby. Then to me, would you mind walking me to my car? Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't even consider her request. I'm alone at the registers, only calling for backup at break time. The rest of the graveyard shift was stalkers, but nobody else was waiting in line, making the ratio of customers to sociopaths one to one. Sure, I'd be happy to walk you to your car. I logged out of my register and walked alongside her out the doors. We both scanned the parking lot. There weren't any panel vans or monster trucks. The sociopath had apparently vanished. I'm just over there, the black Honda. We rolled the car to her hatchback. The baby was making gurgles and gibberish. She used her fob to pop her hatchback, and I loaded her stuff inside as she got her baby carrier situated in the back seat. As she opened the driver's door, she handed me a $20 bill. Thank you. You don't have to do that, I replied. Sure she does came the lisping voice from behind as my head got smashed against the door frame. I went limp and dazed, warm blood cascading down my forehead as my mouth and hands got bound in duct tape. My blurred senses tried making sense of the situation as I was folded and stuffed in the back alongside the pampers and wine. Then the sociopath loaded his plastic bin. He slammed the hatchback and got in the front passenger seat. Your old lady is always ragging on you, huh? The new mother said to him, That's how you talk about me. Uh-oh, I'm going to pay for that, aren't I? The sociopath replied. Well, somebody is going to pay for that, she snapped back. They both laughed. The car started to move with me inside. They're going to kill me tonight. I have to admit, I'm not a particularly bright person. I never did too well in school, nor did I put any effort into improving myself. So, when I finally decided to look for a job, there weren't many places willing to hire me. In the end, my local grocery store was the place that took me in, nurtured me, and paid me. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough to rent a tiny apartment with a roommate. Life wasn't grand, but it was manageable. But despite the bleak start, I quickly rose through the ranks at work. Before long, I was the assistant manager. It was mostly a glorified position. My job was mainly to keep an eye on my co-workers while the actual manager took care of paperwork. Usually, I could let my co-workers be without supervision and the store wouldn't collapse in on itself. We had an unspoken deal. I'd go easy on them and they wouldn't tell the manager that I was slacking off. We quickly fell into a routine. I'd spend most of the day doing nothing. My coworkers did the minimum amount of the required work, and the manager was none the wiser. A few years went by like that, and I was fine with it. Alas, 
Sometimes horrible things happen to regular people for no reason at all. Yesterday was one of those days. I was just enjoying my second coffee in the early morning hours. My co-workers were restocking the shelves and the manager was nowhere in sight. He'd taken a lot of time off work lately and he seemed awfully stressed. Even so, I didn't care too much as it allowed me to be even lazier than usual. As I sat there and scrolled through jokes and memes on my phone, I heard one of my co-workers scream like all hell. Shortly after, I heard a crash as something heavy fell to the ground. What the hell is going on? I asked as I rushed towards the noise. Three of my co-workers just stood there and stared at the fallen box with horrified expressions on their faces. What? I asked again as I moved to pick up the box. That's when I saw it. A pale human arm wrapped neatly in plastic wrap, sealed within a box full of bagged peanuts. I stepped back in shock as a thousand thoughts ran through my mind. I never dealt with a real crisis at work, much less a murder. I think we should call the police, I said in merely a whisper. Donna, try to call the manager, tell him what's going on. The police were busy as usual, and since no one was in immediate danger, they just told us to keep the store closed while we waited for them. One of my co-workers, Harry, had a better idea. He quickly started opening more boxes, just in case there were other body parts hidden within them. Please don't do that, man, I said to deaf ears. Donna, did you get a hold of Mr. Henson? I asked. He's not picking up. Oh my god, I found another one. Harry said. It was a second arm, but this one had a wristwatch attached to it. I'm going to open another. No, don't. I tried to say, but he'd already gone to work on a third box. I sighed and glanced at the watch. It seemed familiar, expensive looking, but clearly a uh, fake. I still can't get in touch with Mr. Henson, Donna said. That's when it hit me. I ran over to stop Harry from opening the third box, but he'd already figured out what was going on. He dropped the box to the floor and it produced a loud thud. There it lay in the clear light of day, Mr. Henson's severed head. We all stood frozen in front of the horrific sight. None of us could find any words to speak up, so we just waited in silence. It felt like an eternity passed before the police arrived, but once they did, eight more boxes were discovered. Each of them contained a small piece of what used to be our store manager. He'd been perfectly hidden in a delivery of peanuts without the faintest clue as to who killed him. Some decided to accuse me, just a couple of morons who assumed I wanted his job. It was a stupid theory that was quickly put to rest when headquarters just sent another manager in his place. A month passed and things were going back to normal. The investigation is still ongoing, but I'm starting to get worried about our current manager. He's been gone from work a lot recently and something is clearly bothering him. I think he might be next. Thanks for watching. You can watch a similar video here. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay tuned for more videos.
I had been a career paramedic, but this happened after only five years. This has never left me to this day, and I sh you not. It happened exactly like this. I was driving home on a rural highway one rainy afternoon. It was really pouring, and traffic had slowed to about 50 miles per hour. I was following two vehicles, and we rounded a bend in the road as a small sports car on the opposite side crossed the center line and hit the small SUV that was leading the three of us vehicles on my side of the road. I immediately pulled over and called 911. It was a bad one. I got out to check on everyone. There was wailing coming from the SUV on the side of the road. That's always a good thing, because people are breathing. So I went down into the field, past the ditch, to check on the sports car. There were two young guys in the car. The force of the impact had driven the engine to where the front passenger seat should have been. The passenger was still buckled. His crumpled hand was grabbing the oh sh handle overhead. The entire section of the car was shoved into the back seat area. The back of the car had peeled away, as well as the top of the passenger's head. His jawbone jutted out, raw and jagged. He was clearly deceased, but I felt for a pulse anyway, all while listening to the gasping, ragged, dragging breaths of the driver. No pulse on the passenger. I tried to figure out how to deal with the driver, but there was nothing I could do. The car had literally wrapped around him, and it would take an extrication team too much time to get him out. Listening to his dying breathing, I apologized out loud to him that I couldn't do more. I told him I was sorry to leave him, but others needed my help too. In my heart, I knew he'd never make it, so I went to render aid where it was needed. In triage, we call this black tagging, a patient who isn't going to survive. I did what I could for the family in the SUV. Emergency medical people and fire services got to the scene and took over. The entire family had injuries, but everyone survived. The mother had permanent brain damage and lost an eye. The whole day, those two guys in the red sports car stayed on my mind. That night, I was home alone and getting ready for bed with just the bedside lamp on, and I heard something in the hallway. It got louder as it came closer down the hallway toward my open door. It was like a thump, drag, thump, drag. I absolutely froze. A broken hand curled around the frame of my doorway. And then, that kid from the passenger seat was standing there. Busted up, just like he was in the car. I'm totally serious. He looked at me and said, Hey, my friend wants you to know he understands. He wants you to know he's okay. We both are. Thanks for trying. He stood there for a few more seconds, just looking at me. And then he stepped back into the shadows, let go of the door frame, and... I listened to him drag back down the hallway into nothing. I turned on every damn light I could. I slept with the lights on for two full weeks. I clipped out their death notices from the paper later that week. Turns out they were both high school seniors on their way home from a wrestling tournament. Their car hydroplaned from what the investigation determined. I'd never have recognized the blonde-headed kid had he come to me as his healthy, unwrecked self. Freaked me the hell out that he came to me busted up. I still have the newspaper clippings. I'll never forget them, nor the ghostly visit. Anyway, that's my experience. I've seen a lot of shit in my 29 year career, but nothing quite that visceral before nor since. About two years ago, something crazy happened as I was going to sleep. One night, I was up late watching YouTube videos, mostly funny videos, creepy videos, and horror story animation videos. I decided to go to bed at around midnight that night. When I fell asleep, I began dreaming of being in a boarding house with seven of my close friends. We literally treat each other like sisters. We chatted for a bit and everything was okay at first. That's when the scenery started to change. I was no longer in the boarding house with my friends. I was surrounded by red walls all alone and saw a floating mirror. 
I was absolutely terrified, but got the courage to walk towards the floating mirror. I saw my reflection in the mirror. I was wearing a white dress. My long black hair was free, cascading down my shoulders and back. Everything seemed normal. Then, my reflection in the mirror disappeared, and was replaced by my friend's reflections. I was so confused, I had no idea what was happening. Then it showed where my friends and I got back to the boarding house. As soon as the door closed, I saw myself begin searching for something in my bag. I had such a blank expression on my face, which was quite odd. It was so creepy and eerie. My friends were just talking, and then I saw something that sent shivers down my spine. I saw myself holding a kitchen knife as I stabbed one of my friends. My other friends were shocked, while the reflection of mine was giving them a wide, sickening grin. I was also shocked because, in reality, I have never hated my friends. I love them so much. I stood in fear as my reflection continued brutally stabbing my friends to death. I screamed loudly, hoping that my reflection would stop, but it didn't. It relentlessly continued. Then, I saw my reflection start eating their intestines and other vital organs. I almost puke at the sight of it. What the heck is happening? Why am I dreaming this? Why would my own reflection do that to them? Thousands of questions ran through my mind. I looked at the mirror and saw my reflection looking at me. She was still holding a knife and her mouth was bloody. I froze. I, I can't move. That's when she walked towards me and stopped. In my reflection, I was chuckling like a maniac. That's when she pointed at my hands and said, <laughs> Look at your hands, they're all bloody. <laughs> I gulped and slowly looked at my hands. To my extreme shock, I was holding the knife that my reflection used to murder my friends. My hands were all bloody. I let go of the knife as I panicked and wiped the blood off of me. I was crying when I looked into the mirror. I saw I had horns on my head, a tail extending from my lower back, and I was holding a staff like I was the devil. My reflection started laughing, and my voice sounded very deep and scary. That's when I woke up, sweating profusely from the nightmare. I was panting like I was running a marathon. The next day at school, I told my friends about what happened. They were just as horrified as I was. I assured them that I loved them, and they know that, because I couldn't turn my back on those who showed me the true meaning of friendship. They smiled and assured me that everything would be fine. Sometimes, we still open up about that nightmare, even till today. And we just laugh at it now, not fully remembering how much it scared us before. We just learn to let go. I'm just thankful that I finally have a group of friends who are loyal and understanding. I tucked my hands deeper into my pockets, clutching onto my keys as a makeshift weapon, all the while trying to ignore the man who'd been following me for the past mile. My phone had regrettably died during a particularly boring family dinner, so calling for help was not an option. I had first noticed him only a few minutes after leaving my parents' place. He was a tall, lanky figure in a black coat and narrow-brimmed hat. He appeared almost comical at first, but once I noticed him trailing behind me several minutes later, I got nervous. Trying to appear subtle, I turned around to get a glance at the man. He was breathing loudly, filling the otherwise silent air with uncharacteristic dread. It wasn't a struggled breath by any means, but one seeming almost mechanical in nature, as if a machine was driving his respiration. Don't look at him, just walk home, I mumbled to myself. Once again, I tried to turn my phone on, hoping I'd have a couple of percent to call someone. As expected, the phone just lit up with a dead battery warning. He walked behind me with impossibly long, slow steps. It was like he hovered above the ground with each iteration. I crossed the street, discreetly trying to get away from my unwelcome stalker. When I noticed him still following me, I'd reached a breaking point. I turned around and held up my dead phone. Look, I'm calling the police if you don't get the fuck away from me. I lied, my voice trembling with each word. As he got closer, I got a better look at the man. He was wearing what looked like a heavily worn World War II era gas mask, obscuring most of his face. 
The small patches of bare skin visible on his neck were covered in massive, pulsating blisters. What, what do you want from me? He stopped dead in his tracks, staring me down without speaking a word. Clunks and wheezes emitted through his gas mask, and I started to doubt if he was even human. Panicked by the sight, I turned around and started running. The stalker barely had to increase his pace to keep up. I dove into a dark alleyway. It was a pathetic attempt at tricking him. As soon as I entered the alleyway, a man in a dark hoodie blocked my way. A second guy swiftly came from behind and grabbed my shoulder. I was trapped. Don't you know it's dangerous to wander around alone in the dark? <laughs> he laughed. Look, I don't want any trouble. That's fine, he said as he pulled out a knife. Just give me your cash and phone and maybe I'll let you walk out of here alive. I did as instructed, more preoccupied with losing my stalker than avoiding a mugger. Five bucks. Well, that just won't do, chief. <laughs> he chuckled as he shoved me to the ground. You'll be a good source of fun anyway. I tried to get up and run, but he stabbed me in the gut. I fell to the ground, grabbing onto my bleeding abdomen. As I lay there, futilely trying to catch my breath, the wheezing sound of my stalker returned. What the fuck do you want? One of the guys said to the stalker. Uh, maybe we should just get out of here, the other mugger said. The stalker slowly lifted his hands to remove the gas mask. From the ground, I couldn't get a good look at his face, but just the sight of it seemed to paralyze the muggers in fear. What, what the hell are you? He said in shock. Then they started twitching, groaning in pain as massive vesicles formed on their skin. They continuously grew larger, some rupturing in the process, causing thick, reeking pus to trickle down and drip onto the ground. They gasped for air as their lungs filled with the same viscous fluid. Within a minute, they collapsed before me, their mouths gaping wide open, filled with blisters, and their skin sloughing off their faces. They had died an agonizing death within seconds. By the time I realized what had happened, the stalker had all but vanished, and I was left bleeding to death on the ground. I drifted in and out of consciousness, only fully awakening once I heard the sound of sirens approaching. I'd been saved. I never saw the stalker again, and to this day, I can't tell you whether or not he was even human. All I know is that he saved my life, and that I will never leave the house without a charged phone again. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and turn notifications on to stay tuned for new videos. And check out our podcast on Spotify by clicking the link in the description. I had always been aware of the deep web. You hear the craziest, most messed up stories from people who have the courage to explore it. Websites that involve human experimentation, hiring a hitman, and even watching people through their own security cameras. It's screwed up. But honestly, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't just slightly interested. Now, just to point out, there was no malicious intent behind my exploration of the deep web. I was just curious to see if it really was as bad as people said it was. The first thing I stumbled upon was a website extremely centered around death, which gave me a really uneasy feeling. So I didn't hang around that web page very long. It takes quite a bit to freak me out. So it's safe to say, I was a little surprised that I couldn't even stomach the first website I clicked on. But hey, it's not supposed to be all unicorns and rainbows, right? Next, I clicked a website that was dedicated to watching people through security cameras. Most of the screens showed empty living rooms and patios. Some of them showed oddly filled rooms, like rooms that were packed with stuffed animals, and another that was eerily decorated with Christmas lights and fake Santa Claus statues. Another screen showed a young woman doing yoga. That one had a lot of views. I didn't watch that one very long. Something inside me felt ill and just wrong. Like what I was doing was sickening. I shut
shook my head, blinking away more curiosity before I hovered my mouse over the tiny X to close the window. Right before I pressed the mouse, I saw a blue link under a black screen that said, Proceed with caution. I bit down on my back teeth, yelling internally to leave the page. Don't click the link. It's not worth it. It could be murder. Would that make me an accomplice? What if it was someone skinning an animal or some weird thing like that? But then again, what if it wasn't? I don't know what the hell propelled me to move my mouse away from the window, hovering it over the link instead, but that's where I ended up. My curiosity always got the best of me, and no matter how twisted my stomach felt, or how strong the feeling of dread was that lingered right over my head, I had to know. I really just had to know what the link led to, or I would go crazy until I figured it out. So I pressed my mouse down and watched the link turn purple. Felt my mouth go dry, and watched as the screen slowly loaded. The page was just a large screen, like the security camera page, only it was just one. The room was concrete. It was dark. There must have been a night vision camera or something, because everything had a weird blue-green tinge. But you could tell there was little to no light. There was a dark liquid on the floor in a medium-sized puddle. I told myself it was gasoline. Don't ask me why. Movement in the far right of the screen caught my attention, and I immediately perked in my desk chair, inching my face closer to the screen of my laptop. It looked like an arm, like someone's forearm. They were standing there, not really moving, but subtly swaying, just enough to not look completely still. Hey, I said, before shaking my head and slapping my mouth shut. Then the person walked. They walked over towards the left of the screen. I felt my stomach knot. I felt my throat tingle and tighten. My mouth was open and my eyes were wide. My face tensed up into an expression of pure disgust. It was a young woman. She looked like she couldn't have been older than 25 or so. Her long, dark, and dirty hair was in tangles, like she'd been pulling at it. Her leg was dragging, and her other skinny leg was doing most of the work as she limped weakly. Her head was down, looking at the floor and the sound of her dragging her foot across the concrete echoed in my silent room. I didn't think it could get any worse. I was so, so wrong. Suddenly, the woman raised her head, and it looked like it weighed a ton on her tiny body. I hadn't noticed it before, only able to barely make out her side profile. But now it was clear as day. She looked around eyes watering with tears and black makeup streaming down her face. Small strands of bloody thread were intertwined in her lips, messily tied, locking them together. Dark blood stained her chin, probably from where she desperately tried to open her mouth to scream before realizing she couldn't. Her dainty fingers were stained as well, the same color as the puddle on the concrete. My whole body felt weak. My stomach was sick. I tried to tell myself it was fake, that it was all a big hoax. My eyes scanned to the bottom left of the screen. 5,623 people were watching. Unable to fight it any longer, I ran straight into the bathroom, puking my insides into the toilet bowl. Everything in me felt disgusting, wrong, twisted. Once I was finally done, I laid on the floor of the bathroom, letting the cool tiles try to soothe my burning body. My head was spinning. I kept repeating to myself, over and over in my head, that I shouldn't have clicked the link. I should have left. I should have closed the window and told my inner curiosity to go screw itself. Instead, I was laying on the floor, the bathroom reeking of vomit, and my mind a complete mess over what the hell I was supposed to do. Should I get the link and send it to the police? Should I call them now? My first instinct was to copy and paste the link, just in case. Then call the police and inform them of what was happening. Maybe they could trace the IP address or something. Maybe they would recognize the girl and know where to start looking. Maybe I could save her life. I'd 
feel really dumb if this was all fake just to get viewers, but I wasn't about to gamble. Not with what was at stake. I ignored the dizzy feeling flooding my head as I jumped up, grabbed the doorknob, and twisted it a bit too harshly. When I flung the door open, my phone buzzed in my pocket, scaring the living shit out of me. I stopped mid-panic and picked it up with shaky hands. I saw my girlfriend's name and immediately answered it. My voice was a complete wreck. My eyes finding the scream where the girl shrunk down to the ground. The sound of her cries bouncing around the room, making my body feel rigid. I had nothing left to throw up, but I still felt so sick. Madeline, you're not going to believe what I just saw. What? You? Are, are you okay? Have you been crying? No, I'm not okay, I answered, averting my eyes from the screen. I know you said to stay away from the deep web, but... Are you kidding me? Her voice went from caring to mad in a split second. I told you to stay away from that place! You never listen to me! You never do! There's a girl, I said weakly. She's trapped in some basement or something, or... Her mouth is... She's... Her mouth is sewn shut. There's... There's blood all over her face and hands. I... I don't know what to do, Madeline. The woman's cries got louder, more desperate, but muffled. I'm so sorry. Close it out. Clear your history and never go back there again. I'm not kidding. But... But I should... I should call. No! The voice was stern now. You don't know if it's bullshit. It's probably staged to gain disgusting viewers. Apparently, like yourself. People do it all the time. That's why I said it'd be best if you just stayed away from there. You could get yourself into a lot of trouble. I didn't say anything, wordlessly walking over to the desk. My hand shook as I raised my mouse to the small X once more. My eyes watched the number of viewers slowly tick higher and higher before I closed the window felt even worse than before. Okay. We can file a report tomorrow just in case, but for now go to sleep and stay the fuck away. I can't believe you even went there in the first place. I didn't have the energy to argue with her. Guilt plagued my whole body, drowning me. It was all I could feel. I told her good night, and I was sorry. But I loved her before I hung up and made my way to the couch to sleep. Or try to sleep. It didn't feel right even being in my bedroom or being anywhere near my computer. Not while that girl was still trapped. Unable to scream for help. Unable to talk at all. I know it could be fake. But was that really a risk I was willing to take? I looked up some Google searches over what was fake on the deep web and read multiple stories about staged webcam videos which made me feel a little bit better. It didn't make the sick, guilty feeling go away, though. It's safe to say that I didn't get much sleep. Every time I closed my eyes or even began to drift off, I would see the woman's face, the thread laced into her lips, the blood staining her mouth, her fingers, the floor. I continued to grow more and more anxious and uneasy, deciding that maybe getting out of the house... Heading over to the local CVS and picking up some melatonin might help. I threw my blanket off, slid on my shoes, and grabbed my keys and wallet from the nightstand. The cool air felt amazing and did wonders to calm the whirlwind of thoughts in my head. I went to check the time, realizing I'd left my phone at home. Not a huge deal. The store was only a few minutes away from my house. I ended up buying melatonin and a stronger sleeping pill, just in case those didn't work. I also got a pack of bottled water to help rehydrate after I vomited up all the contents in my stomach earlier. By the time I got home, I felt much, much better, which lasted about three seconds, before I noticed that my front door was wide open. Now, I may have been in a state of shock and panic, but I never leave my front door open or even unlocked. My heart immediately began to race. I got out of my car, closing the door quietly, and unlocking my trunk, grabbing the crowbar that I keep in there. Who's there? I yelled into the house, 
waiting for any noise. Who is in there? My own voice was shaking and weak. I was met with complete silence. Keeping the crowbar up and ready to strike, I walked to the couch and felt for my phone. As soon as I found it, I hit the emergency button and waited until I got a hold of a 911 operator, letting her know that I think my house was just broken into. She told me the police would be on their way. After checking around the house for anything odd, I decided to give my girlfriend a call, letting her know what had happened. The phone rang, rang, and then rang some more. After getting her voicemail, I hung up, knowing she'd probably be asleep this late at night. I waited about 20 minutes or so for the police to show up, and walked around with them like a scared puppy as they checked every room. They ended up just having me fill out a report, telling me that they'll keep patrol cars in the area just in case anyone else gets hit. As they were leaving, I checked to see if Madeline had called back yet. There weren't any missed calls. I did, however, notice several outgoing calls to her cell phone. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.12 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.14 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.17 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.20 a.m. My mind went into an automatic panic, knowing for a fact that I did not make those calls. Quickly checked my texts, reading one I'd apparently sent out at 3.23 a.m. Hey, can't sleep. Gonna come over. Mind leaving the back door unlocked so I can get in? I didn't send that message. My stomach dropped. My heart thudded loudly in my chest as I noticed her reply directly underneath. Sorry, I was sleeping. Thanks for waking me up, by the way. Lose your key again? It's unlocked. Don't be too late. Without a second thought, I jumped up, keeping the crowbar tight in my hands as I ran to my car. I drove as fast as my little Civic would allow all the way to her house, ignoring any stoplights. It only took me three minutes to get there, but still, I knew it would be too late. I made my way to her back door, feeling every cell in my body burn when I saw it was wide open. My face was hot. My hands were shaking, but I stepped in. Crowbar raised like a bat, ready to swing. I tried to keep my emotions at bay as I looked around her dark house. Madeline? I called out. You okay, babe? Nothing. Silence. Madeline? A small scream came from her bedroom just up the stairs. My legs jerked to a run as I flew up the stairs, slamming her door open. I looked at her empty bed, her empty room. Confused, I heard the scream again. Only this time, I heard that it was coming through her computer monitor. I felt numb as I looked at the screen noticing the same website I saw earlier. Only instead of one woman, I saw two. The first was lying on the floor, not moving, in that puddle of dark liquid. I recognized the second girl, just as I recognized her voice. My heart shattered as I saw her face, streaked in blood. The same threading that was sewn into her eyelids, locking them shut. The scream hit my bones, surrounded my body, it was all I could hear. Her face was twisted in pure terror. I cried pathetically as her voice began to go out, continuing to grow weaker and rasped. I locked my jaw, picking up my cell and dialing 911 for the second time. Only this time, it barely rang once before the deep, gravelly voice of another man answered. You should not have called. Chills shut down my body. As I heard the phone thud, as it hit the carpeted floor, my breath hitched in my throat as I bent to pick it up, hanging up the call and racing down the stairs. How did he do that? How did he redirect my call away from the police? I felt my heart race as I darted out her back door, in a frenzy as I sprinted to the closest house. I pounded the door, screaming at the top of my lungs until the neighbor opened it, her face tired, confused, and scared. She let me in and I explained through frantic tears what had happened. Typing this on my phone to post as we both try to get a hold of the cops, but neither of our calls are going through. Neither is her landline. 
think someone is messing with our cellular signal. They may have cut her line. We're going to keep trying. I'm scared for me. I'm scared for my girlfriend. And I'm scared for my neighbor. I don't know what's going to happen to me. If you don't hear from me again, please take this advice and this experience to heart. Stay away from the deep web. I was jolted awake by the sound of my phone ringing. It was an excruciatingly loud noise to my tired mind, but I couldn't ignore it. Before picking up the phone, I checked the time. 9.34 p.m. It wasn't even late. (laughs) Had I really gotten that old? Jake was the one who'd called, and though I hadn't gotten to the phone in time, he'd left an urgent message. He practically begged me to meet him at the Carlson Pub, which on a Friday didn't exactly sound like a bad idea, if not for the long day I'd had at work. Once I got there, I found Jake sitting alone in the corner, an empty glass of whiskey in his hand, and a worried expression on his face. It was odd. It had only been a week since I saw him, yet he looked older. His wrinkles were more prominent, and his hair had grown thinner. Did you bring it? he asked. I nodded and pulled out a recording device. When he called, I'd assumed that he wanted it for some sort of project, but the look on his face seemed absolutely horrified. Jake, are you alright? I asked. He just shook his head. He seemed wounded, worn out. I don't know how I was supposed to help. Should I call the police? No, please don't. There's nothing they can do. I just need you to listen to me. I am begging you. I don't know how much time I have left. Jake, I tried to say before getting cut off. Just let me talk, please, he begged. He waved at one of the bartenders, who promptly came over to ask what we wanted to drink. Jake ordered an entire bottle of Lagavulin, which immediately triggered a frown from the bartender. (laughs) I'm not supposed to do that, Jake. You know the rules. Before Jake had the chance to argue, I handed the bartender a generous tip. He counted the money and then just sighed as he handed us a couple of glasses. You better start recording, Jake said as he drank the glass of whiskey in a single swallow. I clicked record and directed attention back at him. For a moment, he just sat there and stared at the glass. He touched it in a peculiar way, as if he couldn't quite believe it was real. Jake? Sorry, I'm ready. Here's the story he told me. I was awoken in the middle of the night to the sound of a phone ringing. That's not exactly a particularly new occurrence, except it wasn't my mobile or anything that rang. It sounded like one of those old rotary phones. You know, these high-pitched ringing phones we used to have as kids? At first, I was just confused, thinking it was a dream. Then I remembered that we still had one of those down in the living room. It had been down there since I inherited the house from my parents, a remnant of shittier times. I didn't even think the damn thing was still working. The last phone call that came through was 20 years ago when my father decided to blow his own brains out. Not that it's relevant to what happened, but that old bastard had it coming. Anyway. I made my way downstairs. That's when I noticed just how muffled the sound was. Even when I walked into my own living room, the sound was distant. In a way, it was 
as if the sound came from under the floorboards, hidden out of reach from me. Confused, I just bent down onto the ground and pressed my ear towards the cold floor. Sure enough, it was coming from beneath my living room. Now I've lived in that house my whole goddamn life and we never had a basement. But still, there had to be something down there. A ringing phone was proof enough, but it didn't make any sense. I started searching around the house, looking for any place where I could hear it louder. That's when I noticed something at the end of my hallway. Just on the top of the cupboard, I could see the edge of a door frame. I pulled the cupboard away, and what do you know, there was a door there. One that I hadn't noticed during the 30 years I lived there. Either I was going insane, or no one had ever cleaned behind the cupboard. Regardless of the cause, there was a phone ringing, and I was determined to figure out what the hell was going on. So, without further ado, I opened the door. Nothing but darkness lay on the other side. I stretched my hand in to fumble around for a light switch, but there wasn't anything there. I actually had to take a step inside to even realize that there was a staircase leading downwards. I turned my phone's flashlight on and started the descent. It took me 50 steps to even reach the bottom, and for each step I took, the air got colder. It wasn't the kind of cold you'd expect from a basement. No, it felt as if the darkness was actively sucking the life out from the place. Still, there wasn't a light switch in sight. I had to rely on my dim phone that was already running low on power. I took a few careful steps into the basement. As my eyes started to adapt to the dark, I realized just how familiar the room actually seemed. I took a break from hunting down the phone and glanced around the place. That's when it hit me that the room was actually a carbon copy of my own living room. In fact, it looked like the entire ground floor had been rebuilt, full on with windows and the front door, except it was underground. On the walls, I saw pictures I recognized from my old photo albums, but there was something off about them, as if they'd been taken from a slightly different angle. It just didn't fit with my memories. Even the furniture matched to a T, albeit worn out and covered in dust. Then I saw the phone. Not only was it the same brand as the ancient one I had upstairs, but it had the same faults, down to the broken number 8 and faded paint. I hesitated for a good while before I finally picked it up. But something about the sound compelled me. For whatever reason, it brought out uncontrollable anger in me and I had to shut it up. So I picked it up. And I knew. I... I knew the voice on the other end. It was my father. He was crying just like the last time we spoke. He even used the exact same words, but they were broken and distorted like an old tape recording. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, it was, it was an accident, he said between sobs. I couldn't even respond, I just stood there and listened to his twisted cries. It went on for minutes and... Despite the intense hatred I held for my father, I was feeling sorry for him. Then, he started laughing. 
It was an insane, maniacal laugh that just wouldn't stop. He mocked me for failing to stop him. He blamed me for everything that happened. In a mixture of panic and anger, I slammed the phone back on its handle, a process I repeated until the phone had broken into a thousand tiny pieces. Still, the laughing wouldn't stop. He kept taunting me, and I couldn't tell where the voice was coming from. Without any other ideas, I decided to flee the basement. I rushed back up the stairs, ready to leave the place, and the house itself behind. But the door was gone. In its place, I only found a solid, concrete wall. I was effectively stuck in a nightmarish replica of my own house with no way out. Horrified, I turned to my mobile phone. It didn't have a signal, nor was the battery going to last much longer. I was getting desperate, and despite being about 50 feet underground, I decided to try the front door. Unfortunately, that only led to another stone wall. Same with the windows. There wasn't any way out. I searched every nook and cranny of the damn place. When it finally hit me. The cupboard. The very same thing that had brought me here still existed down there. It even hid the same secret, another forgotten door. With a lot of trepidation, I opened it up. Sure enough, there was another set of stairs. I'd been trapped in the hellscape basement under my own home, and the only way I could go was further down. Thanks for watching. You can watch a similar video here. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay tuned for more videos. My friend Marcus and I spent our last two summer weeks in Croatia. We found an incredibly cheap Airbnb near the beach. Being teenagers, we weren't suspicious about the low price. We booked the apartment. When we arrived, an old lady greeted us to come in. She seemed to be in her late 40s with long red colored hair. She seemed to be pretty fit for her age. She told us we could have the first floor all to ourselves. The only downside was that there was no bathroom, so we had to use the owner's downstairs bathroom. That didn't really seem like a big deal. We unpacked our stuff and headed straight to the beach. The first week went by without a hitch. Just then, a new guest arrived. He got the basement as his place to stay. Here is where the creepy part starts. Marcus and I saw him briefly, and then he kind of vanished. I just thought he might be an introvert and didn't like to socialize. Boy, was I wrong. One night I woke up at 2am to a strange sound coming from the basement below. I decided not to wake up Marcus and went alone downstairs. I stepped down as quietly as possible and followed the noise. As I came closer to the basement door, I heard muffled screaming. I peeked through the keyhole and what I saw gave me goosebumps. The house owner tortured her new guest in indescribable ways. To put it simply, it was Fifty Shades of Grey without the pleasure. I rushed upstairs and yelled to Marcus, we need to leave. We ran outside and called the police. We didn't stick around for them to arrive and rushed home. We both don't know what happened to them after we left. Police never contacted us back. This incident happened when I was eight years old. My dad, mom, and older sister went on a vacation to India with me. 
We wanted to go to the different wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. The plane ride to India was normal until the landing. After we landed, I glanced to my right and there was a huge forest. I really liked animals, so I kept staring to see if there were any animals. All of a sudden, I saw something horrifying. I saw a little girl trying to climb over the fencing to the runway. I was shocked. I nudged my father and said, look over there. He looked as I pointed my finger towards where the little girl was. He said, wow, that's a really huge forest, isn't it, son? I looked back and to my shock, the little girl was gone. I thought it was just my imagination as I was very tired after the long flight. My father booked a local Airbnb. It was a really nice room. It had a lot of space. I personally liked the balcony that faced towards the forest. Although the room was great, I noticed something odd. In the room there was a painting of an old woman. She was holding a plate of strange fruit that I didn't recognize. I was really tired, so I didn't pay much attention to it. Before I knew it, I was sound asleep in bed. All of a sudden, I heard a loud thud. Then another thud, louder than the first. I woke up to the noise. I couldn't see anything other than my mom sleeping next to me. I rubbed my eyes and got out of bed. I walked to the bedroom door and opened it. I noticed that the TV was still on, and I realized that must have been making the noise. As I was walking back to my bed, I saw something that I will never forget to this day. The painting of the old woman caught my attention. I suddenly realized the fruits she was holding were actually organs. Then suddenly the woman in the painting picked the organs up and started eating them. I screamed so loud that nearby dogs started barking. The next thing I know, I woke up in bed. There were scratch marks all over my back. I told everyone about my story. My dad said there was no painting of the woman. To this day, I don't know what to make about these two incidents that happened to me. Was it just a nightmare? Or did this actually happen? I may never know. This story happened to me last year. My friends and I rented an Airbnb in Inverness, Scotland. The place was located far in the countryside, surrounded by trees. The closest house was miles away. I kind of enjoyed that. On the first night, we were all in the living room watching TV. Someone knocked on the door. My friend Ryan went to check on it. He yelled, Guys, come over here. There was a kid standing there. His clothes were all tattered and he looked to be around six years old. My other friend, Austin, asked if he was okay and if he needed help. The little boy never replied. He just stood there looking at us. I thought this was bizarre as we were in the middle of nowhere. I stepped outside and looked to see if anyone was with him. I walked over to the tree line and heard one of my friends scream. I ran back. They told me the little boy just vanished into thin air. At first I thought they were joking, but when we looked around, he was nowhere to be seen. We were all freaked out. Back at the cottage, we all talked about what had happened. Nobody had a logical explanation for the boy's disappearance. My friend Ryan said, One second the boy was there, the next second he was gone. That night, I was woken up by a bang at my window. I looked outside and no one was there. I passed it off as a bird. Suddenly, I heard glass shattering coming from the living room. I ran out. There was glass everywhere. 
My two friends came running out as well. We didn't know what to do. We started packing our things to go. We got in the car and took one last look at the cottage. We saw four people at the window. At that point, I told my friend to drive as fast as he could. We ended up sleeping in the car on the side of the road that night. The next morning, we called the owner and told him about our incident. He thought we were joking at first, but our serious tone convinced him. He said he would look into it. We haven't heard anything since. When I was a kid, my family booked an Airbnb cottage. After we booked the place, there was still two days till our flight. A day before we were supposed to leave, I went shopping at the mall with my parents. There was this creepy man that kept following us. Every single time we turned a corner, he would follow. My father finally confronted the man and told him to get lost. The next day, we got ready for our flight. I completely forgot about the encounter in the mall. The flight was boring as usual. I slowly drifted off into sleep. My mom woke me up to tell me that we landed. We got in a cab and headed to the cottage. As we drove, I stared out the car window and watched as cars drove by. Out of nowhere, I spotted the same creepy man from the mall. He slowly turned his head towards me. He just stared at me and gave me a creepy grin. My heart sank and I started shaking in fear. Before I could get my parents' attention, he sped past us. I told my parents what I saw. They told me it must have just been my imagination. After driving for about an hour, we finally arrived at the cottage. There were two similar style cottages on both sides. As we pulled into the driveway, we noticed the neighbor was watering his grass. When we got closer, we were all horrified. The man was the same creep from the mall. My father told us to calm down and relax. He tried to rationalize the situation. He said this man is likely someone completely different. Just someone who happens to look similar to the previous man. My gut feeling told me this wasn't the case. As we exited the car, my father waved at the man. He waved back with the garden hose in hand. My father said, See, nothing to worry about. That night, I heard weird scratching coming from the window. I groggily turned and faced the window. To my horror, it was the neighbor peering in. I screamed. My father came rushing in and I told him what had happened. He called 911. After some investigation, the police told us the man was a known sex offender. We were lucky to escape from him. This incident happened when my best friend and I were on a trip in Darjeeling, India. We booked an Airbnb near the famous Tiger Hill. When we arrived at the place, we noticed a very foul smell. It wasn't too strong, so we thought it might go away. That didn't happen. As the night progressed, the smell was too much for us to handle. We decided to investigate. There was a room we hadn't checked yet. The door was locked. We could tell that the smell was coming from there. We decided to break the door. After we broke it, we were shocked. There were dead bodies. We were so shocked that we just ran out of the house and called 100. This was the number of the police in India. The police came and investigated. We never really found out what happened. I've always liked Halloween. I loved to trick or treat as a kid and as an adult. 
I enjoyed watching horror movies with my friends and carving pumpkins. A couple of years ago, my buddies even convinced me to go to a haunted house with them. It was a fun night just about every year, and I always looked forward to it, but I don't go out on Halloween anymore. I stay inside, with the blinds shut and the lights off, and I think you'll soon understand why. This all started three years ago, on October 30th. I was talking on the phone with a friend of mine who, for the sake of privacy, I'll call Jake. Jake was unpredictable, which was usually fun, but sometimes got us into trouble, which is why when he invited me to a Halloween party that a good friend of his was throwing, I was a bit hesitant. Come on, man. What else are you going to do tomorrow? You already said you didn't have plans, he persuaded. Jake had a point. I've never really been one for getting drunk or partying, but then again, I've never really been one for sitting at home by myself all night either. All of my other friends already had plans, and this might have been my only chance to get out on Halloween. As I weighed my options in my head, Jake let out a final, well, I gave a short sigh and smiled. <sighs> yeah, sure, I'll go, I said. Jake excitedly assured me that it'd be fun, and he told me he'd pick me up at 8 the next night. Driving to that party the next day, I couldn't help but feel a bit anxious. I didn't know anybody there except for Jake. But knowing one person at a party is a lot better than knowing nobody at a party. Jake made me feel a lot more comfortable that I'd be alone. I was going as Jack from The Shining, and Jake was going as Slash from Guns N' Roses. You ready to rock? He joked as we pulled up at the house. I nodded as we exited the car and walked into the house. The aroma of alcohol hovered heavily over the room like fog, and beneath it, the smell of marijuana flowed lightly through the house. In some rooms, it seemed like there was a body for every square foot. Music blasted throughout the house. I couldn't tell if the music or the talking was louder. Jake introduced me to the guy who was throwing the party, who I'll call Mitch. We chatted for a bit, but it was only minutes before Jake and I were going over to get beers. I didn't like to get drunk, but two late beers didn't do all that much besides helping me relax. The party just kind of dragged on, like a mediocre movie that you're only half paying attention to. Jake was with me throughout, though I could tell he was a lot more drunk and having a lot more fun than I was. And after about two hours, I was getting bored. The constant noise and uncomfortable heat from the crowd wore me down as well. The moon was big that night, and it shone enough that I had a faint shadow. After walking several blocks, I noticed a forest to my left, one that extends all the way to my house, so I decided to cut through it to get home faster. It was strange, but something felt a little bit, well, off about it. I quickly shook that feeling off, however, deciding that it was nothing. The moon was casting faint shadows of the trees, long, thin branches. Brown and orange leaves littered the ground. The wind calmly blew through the trees, and I could hear an owl calling somewhere to my right. I walked down the forest trail in silence, but something stopped me in my tracks. There was a jack-o'-lantern with a cheerful carved expression sitting there on the side of the trail. I was confused, to say the least. Who would put a jack-o'-lantern out here? Who would they think would see it? I kept walking, mystified by the strangeness of what I'd just seen. But I just chalked it up to the workings of someone with a bit too much Halloween spirit. As I continued down the trail, I noticed a flickering orange light ahead, dancing on the surrounding trees and ground. When I got closer, I realized it was another jack-o'-lantern. But this one was different. Its face wasn't cheery like the last one. It looked nervous, afraid, paranoid even. And not just in a cartoony, 
emoticon sort of way. It looked too real. I could feel the emotion by looking at its face. I began to feel the way the pumpkin looked. Paranoid. I noticed my heart beat a bit faster. I looked around and behind me. Kept walking. Now keeping a quicker pace. I can't explain why. But things around me began to seem more disturbing. The shadows of tree branches began to look more and more like outstretched fingers flying at the trail. The wind began to sound less like a whistle and more like an eerie, drawn-out scream. Noises started to sound more ominous, like the whole forest was out to get me. I thought that was bad, but what I saw next was the last thing I wanted to see, a third jack-o'-lantern. This one bore a face that can only be described in one word, and that one word is terror. I could see it, I could feel it, I could practically taste it in my soul. I froze where I stood, jaw hanging open. My heart was racing, my lungs filled and emptied in short succession. I sped along, walking as fast as I could. All I wanted was to get home. All I wanted was for this to be over. I was looking left, right, and over my shoulder, constantly. Visions of a serial killer in a hockey mask danced through my mind, hiding behind every tree, waiting to jump out and turn me into mincemeat. I thought that maybe I was crazy. Maybe there wasn't anything to worry about. My mind tried to tell me that, but I wasn't convinced. As all these thoughts bounced through my brain, I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't watching the path. Out of nowhere, like a flash of lightning. My foot caught on a root sticking out of the dirt, and I fell face down onto the cold, hard dirt. After a moment, I shook off the initial shock and looked up in front of me. I wish I had it. Before me, a mere foot in front of my face was a jack-o'-lantern. Its face was pure shock and horror. It had an ax chopped right into its head. There was blood dripping down from the wound. It was real. I could smell it. The metallic stench that blood gives off. At that moment, I swear on my life that my heart stopped. I couldn't look away. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't breathe. Only one thing could break me out of my trance of horror. The sound of footsteps rustling in the leaves mere yards behind me. Every fiber of my being told me to do one thing. Run. I scrambled to my feet and ran faster than I ever had in my entire life. I don't think I could ever run that fast again. I swear I could hear footsteps running behind me the whole way home. I looked over my shoulder as I ran out into the street, but nobody was there. When I turned back around to face my house, I saw something that made me sick to my stomach. A jack-o'-lantern on my porch that said, Welcome home. I rushed inside and called the police. They didn't find anything in or outside the house. Nothing in the forest either. I can't explain what happened out there in the woods that Halloween night. But one thing is for sure. Someone, or something, was following me, and it knows where I live. What the hell are these things? The drugs? Was it the drugs? It can't be the drugs. Mr. Z always gives me quality stuff. If it's not the drugs, then what the hell is happening? My name is Jake. My life used to be mundane. I did the same thing day after day. Every day went like this. Wake up, go to school, get bullied, and come home. It was a measly existence at best. This all changed in the 11th grade, for better or worse. Two things happened to me in the 11th grade. Kids started to experiment with drugs, and I discovered the dark web. This was a lethal combination. 
My first time on the dark web was innocent. My friend came over for a sleepover. He said, want to see something crazy? This piqued my interest. I quickly responded, yeah, why not? My friend grabbed my laptop and downloaded a VPN and the Tor browser. He copied and pasted a link into the browser and next thing you know, my screen was filled with drugs. I said, no way this is real, man. So I can just buy anything on this page and it will just get shipped to my house? My friend said, yep, that's exactly how it works. You just need to encrypt your messages to vendors with a key and you're good to go. The next day, my friend left to go home. I quickly jumped back on my computer and went back to the marketplace. I scrolled through all the possible options. Weed, wax, MDMA, acid. The possibilities were endless. Curious, I bought one gram of weed. This was also before weed was legalized in my state. One week later, I got a small envelope in the mail. I opened the envelope and there was a pill box. Inside the pill box was one gram of weed. After this success, I quickly logged back onto the dark web to buy more. I logged in and I received a message. It was from the vendor who I bought the weed from. His username was Mr. Z. It read, Hey Jake, I noticed you're a new buyer on the dark web. This is an exciting place full of opportunity. I became a really rich man in this place. You remind me a bit of myself when I was young, outcasted by society, but eager to make it big and stand out. I've done a bit of research on your area and it is a gold mine, Jake. How would you like driving to your senior dance in your own Lamborghini? Having any girl of your choice or maybe even buying your own place? You can be the big man on campus. This can all happen within one year's time if you partner with me. I was shocked and didn't know how to reply. Part of me wanted to tell him to screw himself. Another part of me felt entranced by his offer. Imagining myself pulling up to prom in a nice car was intoxicating. Still, I needed more information. I was young, but I wasn't stupid. I typed back, you don't even know me. How do I know this isn't all just a scam? Well, Jake, for starters, you can look at my reviews. I am one of the highest rated vendors on the marketplace. These reviews can be faked as they are secured in blockchain technology. After you purchased from me, I looked into your life. All I had to do was one search with your name in my software and what I found disturbed me. Anytime someone ever made a social media post with your name, I can see it. My software can even pull from direct messages between people. If your name is in it, I can see it. Let me just tell you, Jake, what I found may disturb you. I quickly typed back, just show me. What he sent shook me to the core. He sent a series of screenshots. It was a Facebook conversation between my best friend, Trevor, and a popular girl in my school named Sarah. The conversation was about a month old. Sarah messaged, Hey Trevor, let's hang out this Friday. Trevor replied, uh, I can't, I promised Jake we would hang out. Sarah said, Jake, that loser? You can't be serious. Trevor messaged back, Jake might be a little socially awkward, but he is cool when you get to know him. Sarah replied, Well, the whole school thinks he's a loser. If you want to hang out with me, you are going to have to ditch that nerd. It just looks bad if you are associated with him. I could feel the rage building inside of me as I read this. My blood was boiling. It felt like steam was rising from my head. I tried to calm down and take deep breaths. 
I replied back to the dark web vendor. I messaged him. This is all photoshopped. None of these conversations you screenshotted are real. You are just trying to play me. He replied. Well, here's Trevor's Facebook username and password. Feel free to log into his account and read the messages for yourself. I did exactly that. And he was right. All the messages were there, right for me to see. I was horrified. My horror quickly turned to anger, then rage. I wanted revenge. My only option was Mr. Z, the dark web vendor. He could change my life for the better. I messaged him back. So now what? He replied, Well, I assume you don't have any money. I will fund your initial startup. The partnership was formed. My dark web vendor sent me one pound of marijuana in the mail for starters. It came in a normal brown box in a vacuum sealed bag. What was weird is that I never saw a delivery van drop it off. It just showed up at my door. No knock, no doorbell. I figured he must have his own delivery system for the larger stuff. He didn't charge me for the first shipment. He told me to sell it around school and to wire him half the profit once I sold it. I happily agreed. It was a bit nerve-wracking at first. Carrying weed to school didn't feel good. After a couple weeks, selling became easy. It didn't take long before I had consistent business. I didn't even have to bring the weed to school anymore. People would just come directly to my house to buy it. This made it a lot less sketchy for me. My parents were divorced and my mom worked nights, so this was a perfect setup. I sold that first pound of weed in three weeks. Since I sold it by the gram, I made a lot of money on the first batch. My vendor suggested I sell it for $15 per gram. I thought this was overpriced, but the quality was so good people never complained. I made $2,000 on that first pound. I quickly became the cool kid at school just as Mr. Z had predicted. Mr. Z was the nickname of the vendor. He never gave me his real name for obvious reasons. My popularity opened a lot of doors. I got access into all of the exclusive parties. What is even better is I never offered my services to Sarah. She tried her hardest to win me over. She even came on to me at a party. But I denied her and told her off. This felt really good. During my senior year, I ended up driving a Porsche 911 Turbo S to prom. It was rented, but nobody knew the wiser. I even had the hottest prom date in all of my school. I was on cloud nine. After high school, I had so much money, I didn't know what to do. Mr. Z told me everything would be fine, that I just had to lay low and hide the money as best as I can. He said when I got to $1 million cash, we would start a legitimate business to launder the money through. Even though I never met Mr. Z, I trusted him with my life. I was forever in debt to him. He changed my life around. My confidence was through the roof. Mr. Z suggested I enroll in a nearby college to expand our business empire. I did exactly that. I ended up renting a house with cash. I could have bought five houses, but that would be too suspicious. I paid for everything in cash, less records that way. My college life started, and let's just say Mr. Z had me sell much more dangerous drugs than just weed. He said the money was much better with these new drugs. And he was right. The money was better than ever. The girls were better than ever. And the parties were better than ever. As the business continued to grow, my ego and confidence grew tenfold. 
I stopped being careful and started living in excess. I bought a Lamborghini in cash and a few other cars. I also bought a nice house for myself. Did I tell Mr. Z? Hell no. I would never. But Mr. Z was too smart. I knew he was on to me. Our messages were shorter, and Mr. Z stopped bringing up future business plans. He had to know about my purchases. The answer to my question and anxiety was answered one fall night. A night that I will never forget. A night that still haunts my life to this day. I picked up the package like normal. I unwrapped it and began dividing the substance into small batches to sell. I noticed this particular substance had a blue hue to it. All the previous orders, the drugs were pure white. This seemed very odd to me. I quickly messaged Z about the order. He said it was a slightly different batch and that it was fine. I believed him. Why was there any reason not to? There was a big fraternity party that particular night. I didn't take the Lamborghini because I thought it would warrant unwanted attention. I just took my BMW. Pulling up to the house, I couldn't believe my eyes. The house was massive. I couldn't believe how big it was. The front had these massive white pillars. I thought this was perfect. A bunch of rich fraternity guys and sorority girls to sell to. The middle of the house was a giant grass courtyard. This is where I spent most of the party selling my product. I couldn't believe how good looking the girls were. But that's beside the point. After selling all my goods, I counted the money. Three grand, all cash. I was about to leave the courtyard when a frat guy, Chad, came over to me. He said, Hey man, that's some good stuff. You got some more? I noticed Chad was jittery and shaking, almost uncontrollably. I asked, How much did you take? Chad replied, I don't know, man. I just need more. I need more. I was getting a little weirded out. I tried to think of some excuse to leave Chad, but nothing came to mind. Chad, you need to calm down and drink some water. Go sit down. Chad angrily said, No, you don't understand. I need more, or else I'm going to die. I stared into Chad's eyes. He blinked, and I swear I noticed what looked like reptilian eyes. He blinked again, and they were normal. Chad continued to talk. Man, I just need another hit. I feel like I am about to change. What the hell do you mean about to change? I asked. He said, It's happening, please. Please help me. I stared into Chad's face. His face was blank. He started to salivate. My heart dropped. I thought he must have overdosed. Then something bizarre happened. His eyes turned. They looked reptilian. I glanced around at everyone around me. They were all frozen, salivating with blank stares. I walked past everyone and bolted out of the courtyard out the back of the house. I looked back and I noticed everyone was following me. Some were crawling. They all were salivating from the mouth. I ran deep into the forest, the crazed pack in close pursuit. After running for a while, I let the pack catch up. As soon as they got close, I doubled back and ran towards the house, hoping this would give me enough time to get home without them tailing me. I got to my car and floored it. As I rounded a corner, I saw them crawling out of the forest towards me. A few turns later and I lost them. I quickly texted Mr. Z, What the hell did you give me? He responded, You better get going, kid. You caused a great deal of trouble for me. I had to get rid of you. 
You were flying too close to the sun. Did you think I wouldn't find out about the Lambo and the new house? I know everything. You need to get a move on. They can smell you for miles. As soon as I got back to my house, I quickly packed four black duffel bags full of cash and rushed out the door. I fled and drove out of the country. After a few years in South America, I thought my life was getting back to normal. Even though I was running low on the drug money, I used most of it to start new businesses. I owned a few dry cleaners and one restaurant. The money was nothing like it used to be, but it felt good to be making an honest living. My old life came back to haunt me one night. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. A crash at my window woke me right up. I pulled up my blinds. It was Chad. Never, ever start a career on the dark web. You will regret it. Thanks for watching. You can watch a similar video here. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay tuned for more videos.